every time you, you get a men a men's gathering like this, we always men always like to talk about iron iron sharpening iron, and 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 that's true, and and that may take place somewhere along the line this weekend. I'm not really looking for iron sharpening, if you will. I'm looking for togetherness, and I'm looking for unity. Yes, and I and I, and and I'm looking for God to take us uh, to another level this weekend with Him. Yes, and our 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 theme positioned for purpose is 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 really critical. If you made up your mind that you want to do something for God, Amen. Amen. So um, today I want to I want to minister for the next few minutes on a title that I've given or that I believe I need to minister on. It's called, and you may want to write this down because you're not going to remember if you can. If you text, if you can text fast like my like my daughter, you'd be good. If you text like me, you are in trouble. Amen. But anyway, I want to minister on the king versus the kid. The king versus the kid. Every king has a kid in him, and every kid has a king in him. But it's when you don't know how to balance either one of them that we get knocked out of position. Amen? Amen. So I want to start off with 2 Samuel 12. We're going to read for a little bit. 2 Samuel 12. And I want to start off in, in verse 1. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, lamb which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It ate of its own food and drank from its own cup, and it lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare, to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused, verse 5, against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb. Because he did this thing because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that, not had, been too, if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Somebody say much more. Much much more. more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You've taken his wife to be your wife and you've killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house and I'll take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the son. For you did, for you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. So David answered and said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin, and you shall not die. However, because of this deed that you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blasphemy, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. In verse 8. I gave you your master's house, and I gave you your master's wives, your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, I want you to notice the favor that's on David's life. God said, I blessed you, and I blessed you exceedingly. 
I delivered your master's house, your master's wives, and your master's kingdom into your hands. And then God said, if that had not been enough, I would have given you much more. The grace and the favor of God. Any one of us here today can live off of God's much more. Can you say amen? amen. But it's the unashamed, unequal grace of God that makes David's sin so much more guilty. When you look at the awesomeness of God's grace executed on his life, David has no excuse to fall to the level of immorality that he did. But he does. Verse 9. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah and, 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 you, and, you, and you have killed him. Why did you stoop so low, David? I would have given you all that you needed. And if you needed more, I would have given you much more. Why did you have to do this? But you, but you did. And so my subject today is the king versus the kid. I believe that 1 Corinthians 13, 11, the Apostle Paul fervently prays this. Hear this. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. And I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I believe that this text refers to a growing up point in our life, if you will, where you say to yourself, okay, I'm old enough now that I'm, I'm ready to put away childish things. But, but the question is, when does when come? When do you get to the point that you put away childish things? At the age of 21, someone said, is when you put away childish things. And that at the age of 30, maybe, but, but I, know, I, I know some 35, some 45, 60-year-old men who didn't put away childish things. And in reality, this is an ongoing process in the lives of most men. Someone once said that the difference between a man, please hear me. Someone once said that the difference between a man and a boy is how much he pays for his toys. Because of our topic tonight, I define toys as the temptations of our youth. And if you're not careful, those temptations will taunt your manhood. And most men are still wrestling with their toys. And you don't know a man till you've met his toys. Because in reality, most men continue to fluctuate between different areas and ages in their lives uh, where they have developed in one way and not developed in another. And I, I, I don't think that there's a man in here tonight who can totally say that he has put away all childish things. Oh, wow. if, you, if you would talk to their wives or, or talk to their girlfriends or, or if you talk to their children, you find out that there are still a couple of things that he struggles with that are not quite locked up in the toy chest yet. Wow. And isn't it amazing how you can have master this area of your life and then struggle with a completely different area of your life. It's amazing how you can be very good over here and, and, and then be weak about something else over here and still be the same person. They're called contradictions. Everybody has them, but not everybody will admit to them. And most people don't even want to talk about them. Now, there's a type of contradiction that existed in the life of David that exists in the lives of most men here tonight. When David was a kid, God came along and said, hear this, he said, you're a king. And he told Samuel, Samuel, I found a man after my own heart, and I'm going to make him king over Israel. Hear this. And God had called David a, 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 a man. He called him a man he, when he was a child. God called him a king when he was still a kid. Which leads me to believe that there is a king in every kid. And that's what parenting is all about. Parenting is unraveling the king in your kid. I thought you guys would clap this. And I believe that 
it. That's why the enemy fights us in the area of our children, man. Because if it's your children that God has predestined to raise up and call you blessed, and the enemy wants to stop up your blessing in the mouth of your kids before it gets there. But I've come to tell you that the devil is a liar. God said that the fruit of your body is blessed. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. David was a kid with a king inside of him. And kids that do the best, do the best when somebody believes in them Amen. and keeps telling them, let me tell you, you're better than this. You might be in this, but you're better than this. You should live better than this. And do you have any understanding of who you are? You're too high to live that low, yes. son. But the problem is they don't see the king in them because of the kid in them. Are you still with me? Yes. Yes. And all of us are attracted to people who see the king in us. As an adult, anytime somebody looks at you and says, I see great things done on the inside of you, you never hang up on those kind of people. We love to find people who believe in us, who, who see a king down inside of you. And if, and if it's true that there's a king in every kid, and it is, it's also true that there's a kid in every king. That in the greatest and the strongest and the most successful, the most accomplished men in this room, there's still a kid down inside of you. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that all of the kid needs to be destroyed. That's not what I'm saying. Because I've seen men who crashed up under the pressure of always trying to be what I call a superman. Yep. Mm. Trying to be, have a superman complex. Yes. And, and always trying to be a, some kind of superhero. Always trying to be rigid and always trying to be stern. You know, iron sharpens iron. And always trying to live up to images and expectations of other people and causing them to have heart attacks at their early ages and die lonely. And they die alone because they're afraid to let anybody know that there's a kid inside of them. Wow. Come on. They've lost all playfulness and they've lost all enjoyment of life. Everything is serious. Everything is important. And there's some men in here that haven't smiled in years because it threatens their masculinity to smile. This is why you see these unlikely couples. Hear me? This is why you see these unlikely couples, uh -oh. these very distinguished and handsome gentlemen who marries an unlikely and unassuming woman. And you ask, why did you marry her? And he says something that blows your mind. He says, she makes me laugh. Yeah. 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 That's right. I'll see that. You haven't got that. Mm. She makes me laugh. That's right. That's why I love my wife. Yeah. Yeah. You I like that, my wife? I like that. And all, all, all the women nowadays want to pull their lip up the top of their head because they're joined Jenny Craig. They, they, they have this makeover on their face. They have these tummy tucks and they have stuff sucked out of them. And, and, and now they find out that all they needed to do was to be friendly to you. Mm. Wow. 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 Suddenly you begin to recognize that all of life, wow. yep. all of life was not that serious. That's right. That's right. And that sometimes people are attracted to people simply because they bring out the kid Come in on them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You look at a woman and, and you love her, you say, you're easy to be around. Yeah, I like that. You're enjoyable. You're not stressful. Yeah. There's no drama. Yeah. And I know you're fine. Well, and I know you're hot. But, but, but you're nice, and I can give up some fine points. I'll take a little ugly, give me half a cup of ugly, and I'll take half a cup, give me a little. If, if you've got some nice down on the inside of you, I don't mind a little cup of ugly. Where are my brothers down here? Come on, come on, come on. I'm just I'll see you. <laughs> And what happens is you begin to realize, brothers, you begin to realize that this woman has tapped, tapped 
into the kid in you. Yes. 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 She's, she's a stress reliever. She's enjoyable. She's fun. And all of a sudden you begin to compromise on some other things that at another time in your life you thought were much more important. But now in this time of your life, if you can find a little peace and a little appreciation, you appreciate me. You're glad to see me. We can work things out. Yes. 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 Good. Yes. And what of the brother? What of the brother who walks away and walks away from that prestigious and important job? And all of a sudden, he gets a job working out on the baseball field, catching old baseballs because the kid in him wants to relax and enjoy himself. Wow, that's good, Pastor. And making money is not as important yes. as enjoying life, yes. especially when you're losing life and running out of time. Wow. Enjoying yourself becomes more important. Wow. So I suggest to you, my brothers, that it's not necessary for you to get rid of all the kid in you. There are some kiddish things that are good for you to keep. Amen. Men who don't learn how to lighten up, that's why we got to be careful this iron sharpened irons thing. Men who don't know how to lighten up, you can't make it. You can't make it because, because there's no release. And what happens is you crack. Right in the middle of life, right in the middle of your career, ministry, you crack for the lack of a smile, for the lack of a joke, for the lack of a hamburger or a happy meal or something silly, going to the beach and getting sand in your crack. You, 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 you crack, you crack. Great minds, great minds break down because of pressure. Great minds break down because of pressure. And I'm not saying that you should get rid of the kid in you because every kid has a king in him and every king has a kid in him. And as long as you can hold on to that kid, it's not hard to find people who will love the king in you. Everybody loves you when you're going up. The challenge is to find somebody who will love the kid in you. Yeah. Understanding the fact that there's a king in every kid and a kid in every in every king is, is detrimental to you positioning yourself for purpose. Yes, amen. Come on, amen. You're off balance. Amen. You won't make it. Wow. So good. And so there's a kid in every king. Say that. King. There's a kid king. in every king. And say there's a king in every kid. There's a king in every kid. And there's no problem with the kid in you. The only problem is, and this is a part of that kiddishness, that if left uncontrolled, that kid in you, if it's left uncontrolled, will destroy your kingliness. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. That's good. Wow. Amen. Thank you, James. That's a good word for everybody. Yes. If that kid in you, and there's nothing wrong to have it, but if that kid is left uncontrolled, It'll destroy your kingliness. That's good. Wow. That's good. That childish behavior, wow. those tantrums where you fly off the handle and go into these fits of rage, it's really kiddish. And all of the kid in you is doing is destroying the king in you. Kiddish behavior, negating everything that you build in the kingdom through one moment of kiddishness, you can destroy 10 years of kingliness. Oh, wow. That's good. That's good. That's good word. Yes. Come on. Man. That's right. Wow. Can we be honest? Yes. yes. Can we be honest? Yes. yes. I had a friend who had asked me if I could give him a ride to a hospital several years back to see his grandmother. And on the way there, he mentioned to me that his grandmother was going on her second childhood. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. A parent boy. She was going on her second childhood, meaning that his grandmother was starting to think, speak, and understand like a child again. Mm. And when children think, speak, and understand like children, they don't have a mark of distinction between what is yours and what is theirs. Mm. They'll reach for anything. They have no concept of ownership because it's childish to go after stuff that's that's not yours just because it looks good, but mm. Sheba. Mm. Mm. Here, David is struggling with his childish side. 
David is struggling with his childish side as a king of Israel. He's the personification of what a king should be. He's a man after God's own heart. When it comes to fighting, he would kill a hundred men by himself. And yet David slipped into some childish behavior, looked across the wall, and this lady who was bathing. Here we go. Come on. Yeah. And he sees this wonderful, voluptuous, sensual. Sexy, hey, hey. seductive, yep. young, Woo. fresh, attractive, vibrant, Hello. delicate, vivacious. <laughs> Somebody said, God, and Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> hey. 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 Bathing in a pool. I'm so glad we have inside showers now. <laughs> <laughs> and David experienced a moment, listen, David experienced a moment of toyish, boyish temptation mixed with human weakness, and he begins to fall vulnerable to his childish toys, his temptations. And if you don't know what that means, you better ask somebody. And now that we've got it, now we've got a situation because the king is now struggling with the kid. Mm. Have you ever seen have you ever seen that before? Yes. David doesn't know how to control the kid in him. He doesn't know how to be mature. Why? Because to be mature is not to negate the kid or the king in you, but to be balanced between the two points, not letting the kid or the king consume or control either side of your identities. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Balance. That's maturity. But in the process of balancing yourself, sometimes you have to go from one extreme to the other. Uh, sometimes people go from one extreme to the other, and this was one of those times. Somewhere in the process of getting through life, you will tip too far to one side or to the other, and now we've got a situation. King David has a situation. Yeah. Can I tell you about the situation? Yes. He slept with her a lot, but she was. And he was, she was married. And so now we've got a situation. She comes to him. She comes to him with a look that the sisters get that says, I'm late. Mm -hmm. Anybody know what that means when a girl tells you she's Watch late? Out. No? I'm not, not, not talking about late for dinner either. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now we've got a problem. Now we have a situation. Can we be men here tonight? Yes. Yes. Now we've got a situation. We've got a dilemma. Now the king is in a crisis with a kid in him. And now he does a kiddish thing. He panics and he decides, I'm going to get out of this. I'm going to have Uriah, her husband, brought in. The king may be kiddish, but he still got power. So in the middle of the war, they bring Uriah home, yeah. the woman's husband. Yeah. And he says, Uriah, you've been in the battlefield a long time. Your lovely wife is here all alone and lonely and, and just as an act of kindness and because of your loyalty I want you to spend a weekend with your wife but because of his commitment to King David yeah. mm. Uriah sleeps outside of David's door wow. refusing to sleep with his wife because he feels uncomfortable with celebrating while other men are suffering and fighting yeah. wow. 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 so now David has got a real situation. Yeah. Because if Uriah had gone in to sleep with his wife, then the dates would have almost lined up with the other situation, and David could have passed it off, and people could have said, well, that's Uriah's baby. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Wow. Now David's trying to get himself out of this mess, but it keeps getting worse, and so now David begins playing around with his next step. Sin, the Bible says, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Yeah. Yeah. So now David says, I'll tell you what, send Uriah back to the front lines so when the Ammonites are fighting, they'll kill him first. Oh, That's how kids think. Yeah. And David got in the situation he couldn't get out of, and it led to having him do something even more radical. And now Uriah, who incidentally loved his king, 
got killed because the king couldn't control the kid. Now, but she was pregnant. Uriah, her husband, is dead. And David's going on with business as usual. And we call it amazing grace. <laughs> Come on. And here comes a knock at the door. And here comes Nathan the prophet. Hear me, man. Hear me. Every man needs somebody in his life who has the right to confront yes. you about your behavior. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because sometimes you be acting like a fool. Yeah, come on. Somebody needs to be able to say, what were you thinking about, brother? Well, have you lost your cotton pick in mind? You need to be, you need to have somebody in your life who has the permission to confront you. Mm. Yeah. Now, it can't be everybody. Wow, no. No, it can't be the self-appointed Nathans that you find in the parking lots after yeah. every service. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, or you find them in the foyer after every service. No, no, because people, people will make themselves a Nathan to you in a minute. Yeah, yes. that's good. Mm. But what about when a sister confronts us? Mm. Uh, we don't like sisters confronting us. Mm. Come on, man, you don't. That's all right, all right, I'll skip that. that. No, I won't. <laughs> Every man does this when they're confronted by a sister and they're right and the man is trapped and he has no excuse as a Lord resort, as the last resort, we do what? We do what? We get mad. Wow, that's Come on. Good. We get we, we get mad. Cause and, and and then we say stuff like like a kid would say we get mad and we say, because I said so, that's what. And then you tell him, you know what? I'm sick of you being all over my back. You just better, you better leave me alone. And come on, guys, you know how we do. Come on. Yes. Come on. Then you'll be looking back to see if it worked. <laughs> Nathan was anointed to deal with things, friend. Yeah. And he comes to David and he says, you know what, David? You've got this guy down the road that's really tripping. I think you ought to make some sort of decision about his behavior. He's got all kinds of lambs, and he's got all kinds of flocks, and young, young lambs, and things like that. And his neighbor's broke and poor, and doesn't have much but one lamb. And the rich man had somebody come and visit him who was hungry, and rather than to reach into his stable, he reaches into the poor man's stable. And he takes his one lamb. They raised and nurtured that lamb, David. It played with the kids. The lamb was like a daughter to this man. Nathan makes you understand that this lamb was dear to this man's heart. And then he asked David, what ought to be done with this man? David and David said, well, they ought to kill him and make him pay that man back four times because we are, you know why he did that? Because we're good at judging other men's sins. Oh, yeah, well. Wow. Good. We're good at judging other men's sins. And it ain't, ain't it funny how we always know how, how we always know what ought to be done about somebody else's situation. Yeah. Yeah. If most men or women ever had to be judged by the judgment they've executed on other people, they'd be put to death. If your child was judged by the way you judge mine, if your marriage was measured by the way you measure mine, if your life was judged the way you judge mine, ain't it funny how people would judge you of something that they're guilty of? That's right. yeah. Come on. David had the ability to see other men's sins, but he couldn't see his own sin. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So David says, this ought to be done with him, and that ought to be done with him. Yeah. And Nathan said, I thought you'd say that you're that man, mm -hmm. David. And David didn't even realize that God knew about the kid in him and that God had seen him. Wow. So the second thing he didn't realize was how much God had blessed him until Nathan said, do you know you're, you were a shepherd boy? Nobody was even thinking about you. When God picked you out, brought you up to the forefront, he gave you your master's house, he gave you your master's wife, he gave you your name and your reputation, and see, most of the time, you don't realize how good God has been to you until you compromise and threaten the goodness of God in your life. Wow. Wow. 
You don't realize how good God's been until you brought yourself down to a point that you could lose it all. And all of a sudden, it becomes valuable because now you're about to lose it. Life becomes valuable to people that are dying. And all of a sudden, they enjoy sunset. And they, they're talking about it's raining, but it's beautiful because somebody, suddenly, their life has been changed because they're about to lose it. A marriage becomes more important when somebody's about to leave you and you begin to say, you know what? This marriage wasn't so bad. I wish I would have kept this thing together. Yes. A job becomes more important when it's gone. We have a tendency to take the blessings of God for granted. David forgot to be thankful for how good God had been to him. One of the worst things, in my opinion, that a man can be, as God raises you up out of all of that stuff, is for you to allow the problems of your success to overwhelm the blessing of the success. And you fool around, and you become unthankful. You start complaining about needing an oil change, and the carburetor needs to be clean, and the car needs to be washed, and you forgot you didn't always have a car. Wow. Yeah. 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 I can't believe we've got to pay this much taxes on this house. A few years back, you didn't have a house. Yes. And all they want me to do is work overtime. You're the same person who was begging God for that job. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Right in the middle of the New Testament where it's talking about idolaters and murderers and envy and strife, it lists unthankfulness. Yes. David's sin above adultery and everything else was unthankfulness. Yeah. And when everything had been compromised, suddenly he recognizes that God had been good to him. I need somebody to stand up right now, and I want somebody to shout, I'm a blessed man. situations, but through it all, you do recognize that you're a blessed man because of the grace and the favor of God over your life. You're blessed to come up here tonight. You're blessed to be alive. You're blessed to have your health and your strength. Your body works reasonably well still. You haven't lost your mind. You've got something to be thankful for, but the enemy wants to convince you that you are not blessed and that you don't appreciate what you have. You won't recognize its value until you lose it. Wow. Come on. All of a sudden, you forget to be thankful. And now David is in this mode. Can I go on? Yeah. Yeah. David is in this mode where judgment has been executed. And Nathan says, listen, you're going to lose some stuff. The sword will not depart from your house. Your children are going to rise up and abuse your wife. Your relationships are going to be disputable. He said, you did it in secret, but I'm going to do it in open, uh, in open uh, uh, areas. I'm going to embarrass you publicly. I'm going to bring you to total humili humiliation. I'll humble you, but I will not destroy you. Mm. And there, there David is, dealing with that kind of praying that even uh, deeply unspiritual brothers pray. They, 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 they do this kind of prayer. Let me see if, uh, if you'll recognize the prayer. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. The prayer goes something like this. Lord, if you get me out of this, you know that prayer? Anybody here know that prayer? Huh? How about, how about, how about this? 
I know this is my fault. I know I've been stupid. I know I don't deserve you. Uh, and I know I didn't listen to the warning signs. Lord, I know I messed up. But Lord, down deep in my heart, I love you. You know that prayer? Yeah. Uh, you know that prayer? I love you, Lord. And if you would please get me out of this, I promise that you won't have to talk to me no more about this. Mm. Oh, yeah. That prayer is more common than we think, right? Yes. Yeah. Every single one of us knows yes. that prayer. Yes. And you start negotiating with God like a kid. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Have you ever talked to, to a kid that's about to get a good whooping? <laughs> <laughs> Have you talked to him? There's a conversation sound, sounds something like this. Mama, I ain't going to do this no more. <laughs> you ever heard a kid do that right, right before you spank him? Uh, Mama, I, I promise you, Dad, you, you, you ain't got to spank me, Dad. But, 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 uh, but, but if you get me out of this. I mean, that, the, the kind of prayer where you know that you're in trouble. Does anybody know, here know, what that's like? Have you ever had to go to God like that because you know you're in trouble? Yeah. No. no. See, you have to know what I'm talking about to know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about praying scared. I'm talking about fear where food ruts in your gut and you can't get to sleep. The fear that makes you get down on your knees and you say, God, please, please, God, have mercy on me. Amen. Fear. Yes. Helen's about to call Dolores and tell on you. You've been lying and cheating to the welfare people and now they want to see you. Fear will make you sick. You've been trying to get out of the taxes, but now they've caught up to you. I'm talking about being nervous. I'm not talking about uh, just anxiety. I'm talking about fear. Yeah. This is when David went to God. And he was petrified. And he said, oh God, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And Bathsheba has birthed a baby. And the baby's sick. And David's asking God for mercy. And God is dealing with, for, with David. And David is trying to deal with God. He's wrapped himself in sackcloth and ashes. Because now you don't want to do nothing. Now, now, you don't want to date nobody. Now you're in church on Sunday, Wednesdays, whenever the door is open. Now you're in church. Now you're in church Wednesday night. Now you're tithing. Now you're giving. Now you're trying to get involved in the children's ministry. You're thinking about becoming an usher. You can't, you can't even sing, but you, you want to be in the choir. And what has happened, what's really happened here, hear me. What's really happened is that God has allowed David to encounter this kiddish behavior before he goes any further into the kingdom. And God is dealing with many of you with this kiddish behavior before he can position you for purpose. Yes. That's good. That's good. And God will put you in the mode of corruption before whatever kiddish in you destroys the king in you and gets you out of position. God knew you were a kid, and he knows how to deal with a kid inside of you, and sometimes it can be painful. And now the kid is on the altar. Bathsheba has had a baby. The baby's dying. David's kingdom has been shattered. He's been humiliated. He doesn't even know if God would even see him again. He's just out there praying in sackcloth and ashes. And he's praying, but he's still not praying right. He's praying that God would let the baby live. And sometimes we're putting a lot of energy asking God to keep something alive that needs to die. Amen. Come on, preach. Wow. Wow. Come on. Mm. Mm. Oh. Some of you all are trying to save a relationship that you need to just let die. You're trying to resurrect something that you should have left in the graveyard. It was killing you. It was destroying you. It's not that it has a hold on you. It's that you have a hold on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good word. And as David's trying to hold on to something that God's trying to get rid of, I wonder... Are there any brothers in here tonight that are trying to hold on to something that God's trying to get away from you? Yes. 
The hardest thing was to get David to see the severity of his own sin because it's easier for us to see the severity of other people's sin than it is to see our own. Truth. Truth. God's convinced uh, David. David, can you see what the kid in you did to the king in you, son? You've compromised your favor, David. You've lost your influence. You're down to nothing. And David's weeping and crying out before God, I won't be much longer. Trying to get his place back. Because you see, what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to repent. Yeah. If I can repent, you can be restored. You've got to find a place of repentance. It's a grace to repent. It's a grace to, to, to have the ability to say, I'm wrong, and I'm sorry, and I'm ready to change. Yes. And God gives you the grace to repent. Yes. To find a place of repentance is truly a gift from God. Amen. Does anybody know what it is to repent before yes. God? Yes. I mean, where God opens up your soul and you say, God, I'm sorry, yes. and if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again. Whatever I needed to learn, Lord, I've learned it. I've grown up. I'm thinking straight. Forgive me, Lord. Create in me a, clean, a new heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Purge me with his up. Wash me, and I shall be clean. Take it out of my heart. Take it out of my mind, Lord. I don't want it. I don't need another toke. I don't need another drink. I don't need another deal. I don't want it. I don't need another drug. I don't want it. I don't, I don't need any more drug. I don't need another rumor. Deliver me, Lord. That's A good. place of repentance is the grace of God in action. Yes. Amen. And David is wondering if he's gone so far or done so bad that maybe... God doesn't want him anymore. When David heard that the baby was dead, they didn't even want to tell him that the baby was dead, but he perceived that the baby was dead, and he got up, and he washed his face, he changed his clothes, and started coming towards the house of the Lord, because even though the baby was dead, that was the bad news. But the good news was, God was ready to restore him. Yes. It was at this point that David wrote, I was glad, I was glad, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad. I was glad when I got the word that I was forgiven. I was glad when I found out that God would wash me and restore me. I was glad when I found out that God would give me back what I lost. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I'm going to praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him from all his yes. infirmities. Oh, I wish somebody would Amen. Jesus is calling you. And you could have done some horrible stuff and let the kid in you destroy it. The king in you. That's never really been positioned for purpose. You could have been done horrible stuff. And in the middle of your dilemma, the devil's trying to tell you how you messed how messed up you are. You did so much, and there's no way God would want you. You messed up your marriage, you messed up your career, you've done some horrible stuff. But I want you to hear this word, brethren. I want you to hear this word. And I want you to let you know, I want you to let it, let it get way down deep in your spirit because this is the sum total of everything I have to say to you today. The Lord loves you. That's good, yes. 
The Lord loves you. And he loves the kid in you. And he loves the king in you. He loves the right in you. He loves the, the wrong. He loves the weak. He loves the strong and the bruised and the fallen. And he loves the battered and beat up, stomped on part of you. And he's waiting on you to get your act together. Yes. He's waiting on you to get back into yes. position. Yes. Because right. you're going to be positioned for purpose. Amen. And I believe with all of my heart that it should begin tonight. Amen. Yes. I said it should begin tonight. Amen. Yes. You must make sure that you're positioned for purpose. It is critical. Yes. Yes. It is critical good. that you make sure you're positioned for God's purpose. Amen. And I believe that's why he brought you up here tonight, Amen. this weekend. And I believe the Lord's talking to you yes. about whatever situation you might find yourself in right now. There's something that God wants you to understand. And if you can hear this word and receive this word, I want to do something. I want somebody to get up, give me some music, and I want to, I want to pray with you tonight. Amen. Amen. If you if you receive this word, the king and the kid in you, and whatever it is that you're dealing with, that God loves you and He wants to restore you. He wants to get you back in position. So some of somebody here might be thinking, well, you have no idea what I've done. Then you have no idea of what Jesus has already done about what you have done. I don't know how many will come up. This is family business tonight. This weekend we're up here because of family business. There's no messing around. Not in the sessions. Be a kid. But when it comes to this, be a king. Come on. Come on. We're not going to talk about any certain situation. Thank you. We're not going to talk about any certain problem. You know what it is. Nobody else has to know that God knows what it is. Nobody else has to know that. I'm just going to lay my hands on you. That you would get understanding that it's not so big that God can heal. so bad that God can't forgive. Somebody take this. Hallelujah. Step forward. Step forward. Step forward. Anybody else? We're here to be truthful with one another, brother. We're not here to, to hide anything from God. God makes a call to you respond. Father, in the name of Jesus, brothers, can you lift your hands up? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your plan for this weekend for my brothers. Oh, it's a great plan. Uh, it's a breakthrough plan. It's a miracle birthing plan. It's a, it's a plan of restoration and rebuilding and raising up. And it's a great plan, Lord, because it's your plan. It's your plan. And we know that you planned this plan over 2,000 years ago. And you planned it for us even before we were in our mother's womb. You planned this night. But 2,000 years ago, you planned this weekend. You planned every sermon that's going to be preached, every lesson that's going to be taught. You planned it before we were in our mother's womb. And now here it is being manifested right in the front of our own eyes. What a good God we serve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, Father, I thank you for a spirit of restoration. Everybody repeat after me. Say, Lord. Lord. 
I repent. I repent. Tonight, Tonight, I change my way of thinking. I change my way of thinking about the stuff I've been doing. About the stuff I've been doing. The stuff I've been thinking. The stuff I've been thinking. The stuff I've been saying. The stuff I've been saying. The way I've been acting. The way I've been acting. I'm going to change my way of thinking. I'm going to change my way of thinking. About all of that. About all of that. That's how I repent. That's how I repent. That's how I repent. You can't change your heart about what you're doing until you change your mind about what you're doing. And say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive. I receive your grace, your, grace, your, grace, your favor, your favor, and your forgiveness, and your forgiveness, and your forgiveness now. now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We worship you, God. Thank you, God. We worship 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 you, God. We